Friends, welcome. Uh, my name is Drew Payton. I am the Associate Pastor for Justice and Outreach here at First Pres Berkeley. I uh, want to thank Presbyterians for Earth Care for hosting this uh, rich, inspirational, urgently necessary conference and for partnering with us to host this one day here in Berkeley, which has been wonderful. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers for all of their wisdom um, and guidance today, as well as Beth Thompson uh, here at First Pres and many others who have labored behind the scenes to make today possible. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank those of you who have made the hopeful, faith-filled, uh, love-filled decision to step away from other demands and possibilities to be uh, here today, whether in person or online. I just want to remind folks that uh, all of the recordings from this conference will be made available online on the Presbyterians for Earth Care uh, website um, following the conference. And uh, immediately following this portion of the discussion, wine and cheese, uh, a wine and cheese reception will be held uh, immediately, immediately afterwards. Um, so we know, friends, there's not a single issue or person or place we care about that, that isn't touched by climate change. Not one aspect of our shared life and created world, this inescapable network of mutuality, as Dr. King put it, that isn't impacted. Um, so thank you for those of you who are willing and wanting to act in the ways available to us. Thank you for being those uh, who, who are here and, and willing to give of yourselves in this way. Uh, not just for yourselves and those you love, but for the whole human family and all of creation. So to those immersed in this work already and to those coming to it for the first time, thank you. Uh, it is now uh, my distinct honor and thrill to introduce you to our plenary speaker this afternoon, Dr. Jeffrey A. Reimer. Dr. Reimer is the C. Judson King Endowed Professor and Warren Catherine Schlinger Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department at UC Berkeley, where he has won every teaching award offered, including the university's highest honor, the UC Berkeley Distinguished Teaching Award. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Physical Society, and the International Society for Magnetic Resonance. He also received a 2015 research fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Dr. Reimer's uh, 260 plus publications have been cited more than 20,000 times. The Hirsch Index uh, measures the productivity and impact of particular scientists and scholars, and I'm told, uh, I don't know anything about this stuff, but I'm told that a Hirsch score of 20 is considered good, 40 is considered great, and 60 is considered remarkable. Dr. Reimer's Hirsch score is 71. Additionally, he is the co-author of Chemical Engineering Design and Analysis and Carbon Capture and Sequestration. His contributions to environmental protection and human sustainability are enormous, and he is well qualified to guide us as we seek not only to understand climate change, but to respond in faith and hope. Dr. Reimer is also a longtime member and esteemed elder, a well-loved elder here at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley who is not above dirtying his hands, flipping burgers for college students, as I watched him do just a couple weeks ago. And uh, according to Wikipedia, he once spent a summer or two working as a custodian at Universal Studios. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, but I think it's definitely worth asking about. <laughs> When I first met Dr. Reimer, uh, when I arrived here two months ago, I believe his first words to me were, I'm Jeff Reimer, I'm no one important. He is a genuinely humble man, uh, but every other, every other person I've asked about Dimer, Dr. Reimer has told me, this is someone you want to know. I am so glad and grateful I get to know him, uh, and so glad and grateful that you all get to know him now too. Dr. Jeffrey Reimer. Well, I wish Mom could have heard that. Thanks, Drew. 
So what does 420 ppm mean to you? It's an interesting number. It's so tiny, isn't it? It's 21 people out of the 60,000 at the Beyonce concert. Uh, it's zero people out of an Oakland A's attendance, as I found out last night. What I'm going to try and convince you of in the time we have together is that 420 ppm is a lot. It's very consequential, uh, and there are things uh, that we can do to deal with that. So uh, follow with me, as you will. Let's move along uh, on these slides. We are moving along on these slides. Trust me that we did this before we... Super, okay. Let's take a look at the left-hand portion of this graph, will you please? That is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, parts per million, same on the right side. Uh, and on the bottom is time, going back 800,000 years before the time of Christ. And you'll recognize that the concentration in the ap CO2 in the atmosphere has bumped up and down a lot over those many 100,000 years. Indeed, there are many ice ages where the concentration is pretty low, and uh, there are warm spare parts at 278 parts per million. That's been the planet Earth for the past million years or so. And in case you're wondering, uh, according to anthropologists, Homo sapiens, uh, as we know them today, were introduced uh, from, you know, from Africa in about 300,000 years ago. Now let's look at the span of the ups and downs for the past million years. And that span is shown by the red arrow. Now, let's imagine what that is in the context of our current numbers. So if I move that arrow and ask, what is one more than the biggest span that we've seen in the last million years? And we're way off from today's, uh, or at least this last week's 419 parts per million in the atmosphere. So we are experiencing, for the past million years, an unprecedented concentration of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So how do we account for that carbon dioxide? There are many memes on the internet uh, that I like to use in lectures like this. I'm going to show you two because I think they're particularly powerful. So for example, in the year 2017, we introduced 1,400 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere just from coal-fired power plants. That same year, we produced about 344 million tons of plastics, which is to say, we put four times as much carbon into the air as all the plastics produced on the earth just from coal-fired power plants and nothing else. Here's another nice meme. Uh, let's take a look at humanity uh, as shown in this uh, sort of uh, schematic and ask how much does humanity weigh? Let's take all of humankind and put them on a scale and ask how much does the world weigh at 8.1 billion people? And the answer is about half a gigaton which is to say 500 million tons. That's a lot of people. In the year 2020, 20, uh, 2021 alone, humans put 34 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. That is to say 70 times the weight of all the people on the planet was put in the atmosphere in just one year. So 420 ppm is a lot of carbon. The atmosphere is big, but that's still a lot of carbon. And so where does it come from? We turn to organizations such as the International Panel for Climate Change uh, that have tabulated this kind of information. And in blue here, it shows you that most of the carbon comes from burning. It comes from burning fossil fuels for all the things we need. And we'll come back and look at that in a minute. You've heard a lot about methane and other sources of greenhouse gases. I'm not gonna talk very much about methane, but it is a problem. It's a problem because methane has a bigger effect for uh, climate change than CO2. Good news is methane only lasts about 10 years. The bad news is it degrades to CO2. So where does all that carbon dioxide go? And this is where we have to understand that not all the carbon we emit actually winds up in the atmosphere. 
So in pink here shown the human emissions, and that's about 10 or 11 gigatons of carbon, per, uh, carbon dioxide per year from human activities. Where does it go? Well, about 25% of it is taken up by the oceans. Part of that is CO2 that's dissolved in the water. It changes the pH and makes the oceans acidic. Uh, and it, uh, it participates in a number of natural processes that take place in the oceans anyway. There are, uh, the land takes up a lot of the CO2, and we've tinkered with photosynthesis and respiration to the point where some, maybe a third or so of the carbon is taken up by plants. When you hear people talk about natural solutions to climate change, by and large, they're talking about tinkering with either the oceans or the lands, and we'll come back to that in a minute. The cur uh, current worry for me and for us for the next few minutes is about half of that CO2 winds up in the atmosphere, and that has consequences that we need to look at. So we were at 420 ppm, or 10 uh, or so gigatons per year into the uh, atmosphere. So what happens in the future? And many of the things that you read in the media and many of the things we imagine and worry about are projections. And these projections require assumptions. And you need to know what the assumptions are because they reflect directly upon our lifestyle. So this is what the International Panel for Climate Change calls options. These numbers at the top, like SSP4, are titles or labels for economic models for how we all get along. So over here on the left, this lovely notion of a sustainable world where we bring our carbon emissions into balance uh, with the natural environment. And if you look at this graph, you see that the rings emanating from today represent time, and these vertical blocks represent the model, and lines on the block represent the extent to which we mitigate uh, the carbon emissions that are coming from our lifestyle. Over here on the right side, a much more interesting in some ways, which is what happens if we continue to mine, uh, extract, and burn fossil fuels at the rate at which we can discover them until they're all burned out. And uh, the, obviously, that leads to the biggest climate impacts, hence the color of this bar. But even if we did that, there are mitigation strategies the IPCC talks about where we could possibly still burn fossil fuels and mitigate them. You will see uh, in the course of this talk, I'm not a big fan of those, but maybe some of you are. But I want you to understand clearly, if you want to extract and burn fossil fuels for the next 100 years to mitigate climate change, you need to put into practice a large number of things. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. So let's go back to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and talk about our future now. So here in the middle, that's that bumpy curve I showed you earlier uh, the past million years or so, ups and downs, warm ages, ice ages. Here's the time since Christ, and here's our recent bump. If you go way back in time, 55 million years, you'll recognize that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was much, much higher. On the right-hand side are these models. See the green one here? That's the sustainable model where we're bringing carbon down. And the top one here is where we extract and burn. The reason this is worrying, at the year 2100, is if you draw a line back, you're at 1,000 or more ppm of CO2. And it turns out the Earth has seen this before, and fortunately, uh, scientists and geologists and others have been able to construct what the world looked like during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum 55 years ago. And this is what the world looked like. Caution, because continents drift, then continents are not all in the right place compared to the map you're used to. Nevertheless, you can see that these temperatures, which are in degree C, apologize for those who aren't scientists, but you can recognize there are parts of the planet in which it would be very difficult for humans to live because the uh, wet bulb temperature of the planet is hotter than our bodies could survive. And you will also recognize it because there's no ice, uh, the world is largely engulfed uh, in certainly Europe and Northern Africa, much of South America, Eastern United States are underwater. So that's why these apocalyptic terms come up often in the literature when we talk about this kind of economic model. Extract and burn, 1,000 ppm, a planet which seems inhospitable. Now, I can't imagine, and I'm sure you don't either, anybody is actually hoping for that kind of outcome. On the contrary, we are not. 
Nevertheless, the planet has tinkered with that outcome, and we've seen what it looks like. So we uh, are warned. So there's one physical concept that I have to convey to you today. It's the one thing I want you to take home. It's probably the most important and perhaps most vexing concept, which is why is CO2 and temperature of the planet connected? And it's important you appreciate that because many of the strategies that people talk about for mitigating climate change involve tinkering with this thing called radiative forcing. Let's take a look what that is. How would you figure out the temperature of a planet if you were a scientist? Well, you would start with the sun, which emanates radiation, sunshine, and it lands on the planet Earth. And if all that happened was sunshine landed on the Earth, we'd get hotter and hotter and hotter. But fortunately, the planet Earth also radiates into space. That's Earth shine. And the nice thing, the wonderful thing about physics, uh, is that it tells us a great deal about what the nature of this radiation is. It's in watts per square meter, uh, and it's called black body radiation, and it's uh, proportional to the temperature of the planet to the fourth power. So these laws and these concepts uh, allow us to calculate what the temperature of the planet Earth should be, knowing the distance from the sun, knowing the output from the sun, knowing from the output from the Earth, and introductory students in our discipline make that calculation, and they find out that the Earth should be about minus 30 degrees. And of course, it's not, and we'll see why in a minute. But that's radiative forcing. Now let's take a look at uh, what is going on here. Because energy is conserved, the amount of energy landing on the planet from the sun equals the amount of energy that emanates into space. Uh, the conservation of energy is one of the most cherished principles in all of science, which is to say the flux of energy from the sun landing on the earth is balanced by the flux of energy of the earth into space. And if we were a lot closer, we'd be a lot hotter, Venus. If we were a lot further, we'd be a lot colder, Mars. So we're at just the right place for this. Okay, so let's do an experiment, shall we? Let's go into space and let's put a giant umbrella into space. And we'll block some of the radiation coming from the sun. What are the consequences of that? Well, the flux from the sun coming to the Earth's surface will go down because of the umbrella. And as a result, the flux from the Earth will go down because of, the two, of this equality, right? And that means that the temperature of the Earth has to go down. So this is an example of what's called geoengineering. People talk about it. They actually talk about putting entities into space that are sail-like, that block the sun. Or a little more local, they talk about putting particles into the atmosphere to block the sunlight and act as an umbrella that way. Mm. We know that works because when there's a massive volcanic eruption, the temperature of the planet actually cools because the ash in the atmosphere acts as an umbrella and blocks the sun. Uh, the ash goes away after a little while, and then, of course, we return to equilibrium. So that's an example of geoengineering. People talk about doing that. Now, let's think about it in the inverse, though. Let's turn it upside down and ask, what if I put an umbrella above the Earth that absorbs the earth shine or blocks earth shine. Now what are the consequences? Well, this is a little trickier because I've temporarily made the flux of light earth shine from the planet earth go down. But this equality is still true. So sooner or later we have to come into balance. That means the temperature of the planet has to go up so that the flux uh, from the earth shine matches the incoming from the sunshine. That's called radiative forcing. And it tells us that if we put something into the air that blocks Earth shine, the temperature of the planet will go up. It's been measured. This is a really nice, uh, oops, a really nice experiment uh, that was published from Berkeley researchers about four years ago. This is the measured radiative forcing. And how do they do that? They put detectors on the planet, sort of infrared cameras. They put detectors in space on satellites, more infrared cameras, and they measure the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and all those properties. And what do you find? This incredible causation, huh? Radio forcing goes up and down. Uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere goes up and down. And by the way, they made these measurements for 10 years running. We talk about a difficulty from the scientific point of view is starting an experiment that takes 10 or 15 years to publish. Uh, I, those of you who do science would know that's vexing. 
So um, radiative forcing has been measured by CO2. It's the reason the planet warms. We put an umbrella uh, into the atmosphere and it blocks the earth shine. And there's one other little subtlety about this before we can look at consequences, which is exactly how does the atmosphere of the earth sort of change this? So here's this picture, here's the downcoming radiation from the sun according to the mathematical formulas, physics formulas, the outgoing radiation. The sun is mainly visible, the earth is mainly in the infrared. But then we have to look, what does the atmosphere do to that? And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll recognize that the atmosphere blocks a lot of the ultraviolet from the sun. And that's good news for all of us, because uh, that is, for example, ozone and oxygen, which absorb a great deal of the infrared radiation, uh, excuse me, the ultraviolet radiation. You've heard of the ozone hole. That was an, uh, a problem uh, in which ozone was disappearing and more ultraviolet was appearing on the planet. Over on the right-hand side, look at all this absorption that's happening here in the infrared. That's CO2 and water. The reason the Earth is not minus 30 degrees C is because water is an extraordinary greenhouse gas. And it does an excellent job of warming the planet to the temperatures that we've become accustomed to, plus or minus a little for the past million years. Now the tricky thing, let's just take this uh, plot and invert it and show how much gets through. So now sort of the difference between these two is actually what appears on the planet from the sun. And there's some holes here due to things in the atmosphere that absorb light. And there's a, a very narrow window, actually, in which Earthshine can punch through. If I introduce a new chemical into the atmosphere that sits in this window of absorption, that's a very effective Earthshine shade, and it'll warm the planet. Turns out CO2 absorbs over here, and methane absorbs over here. So that's the reason why those two gases are particularly important. It's also the reason why water doesn't matter, because water has been there for a million years, and it has effectively regulated our planet to the point where we are, or have been, happy. So let's take a few minutes now and talk about consequences. Uh, I think um, many of you are aware and have seen these kind of graphs before, where in terms of the physical sciences, carbon, co carbon dioxide, changes in our precipitation patterns, glaciers uh, being lost, of course, temperature rising, sea level rising, ocean heat content enormously increasing. Uh, these are all things that we could spend an hour, actually a semester if you take my class, talking about them. That would be a lot of fun if you came for that. Uh, but I'm going to narrow the focus of consequences onto a few examples that have to do with human behavior because I think these are aspects of these changes that are not commonly talked about in the media. So for example, did you know that global warming has already increased economic inequality on the planet? It's not hypothesized, it's been measured. And so the idea is you look at the temperature changes around the planet and you recognize, for example, that the Northern Hemisphere and the North Pole in particular has warmed much more than the rest of the planet. Why? Because it used to be covered with snow and ice, which reflects a lot of sunlight, and as that snow melts, it exposes land, which is darker, and it heats up much more rapidly. So what happens if a country like Norway experiences climate change? Uh, the authors here show the percent change in the GDP of that country as a function of time, and looked at the effects of warming. Warming increases farm productivity, it increases worker productivity, and so forth. And you recognize that the cool countries benefit from, uh, from warming. A country like India, however, faces just the opposite. That is to say, the global uh, uh, GDP goes down with increasing temperature because it's already hot and gets a lot hotter. So if you look then at the probability of economic damage done by climate change in the world, you recognize in this window of time, it's the global south which is experiencing most of, of the, uh, of the uh, economic damage. It's a theme that comes up today time and time again. It's a theme Dr. Holcomb talked about earlier today, which is that it's incredibly frustrating that climate change disproportionately affects the poor. And it's a, a, an important connection to make to our Christian faith. Do we want to live in a place where the principalities and powers disaffect the poor. 
you think about that. Let's take a look at some more examples. How about suicide? So, for example, colleagues looked at uh, tweets. I guess I should call them X now, but at the time they were tweets. And at that time, the authors noticed that as the temperature was warmer, the number of depressive tweets uh, uh, grew rapidly. 600 million geolocated tweets. And then they looked at data for suicides and found that we are much more likely to commit suicide when it is hot. So here, for example, is the suicide rate at the average temperature. And as the average temperature creeps up, the suicide rate goes up, similarly for Mexico. And that can be translated now into what's going to happen in the future with these economic models. And what the future holds is that by 2050, there's between 9,000 and 40,000 9, 40, more suicides than there would have been without climate change. The planet is warming. What if we want to move someplace? Let's suppose you've decided that, you know, Albany or Pittsburgh is just too hot. And now you want to move someplace that has a temperature just like you used to experience. And authors figured this out recently uh, based upon a model for the two degree C scenario. So here, for example, uh, is what that model says is the temperature of the planet as a function of latitude. Uh, it's only from minus 50 to plus 50 because uh, that's really all the good data the authors had access to. So mind you, economic model for a two degree city scenario, this is how the temperature of the planet has changed in the two degree scenario. They can take the slope of that line, that is its change, and calculate then what the temperature change is from now at the latitude, at these latitudes. And then they can take the slope with respect to the other axis and calculate then the temperature change per foot traveled up or down on latitude to figure out how far you would have to go. I, kn I know you're a little frustrated because this is a negative number. That's because latitudes are negative down here. So to plot absolute value, that's really what it looks like. Or plotted more accurately, Here's the temperature preserving length scale as a function of latitude where you live. So that's the migration distance if you want to keep the same temperature. Let's take a look at that on a different scale. And I've converted it to miles to make it easier for all of us and remind you how far it is to go to Fresno. And if you look at this map, you'll recognize that almost everywhere in the world is going to have a temperature change. And if all of us moved in response to that temperature change, the global migration would be horrendous and the consequences enormous. We've talked about global sea levels and other consequence, but maybe not so much in the context of people. So here, for example, is the measured global sea level change up to 2020. Uh, we're up to now, you know, something like 55 centimeters higher. But let's ask the following question. What does that mean for cities that are right on the water? And we've been, we, the scientific community has been looking at that for a while and have made projections as to what that looks like. And maybe you've read about those projections. We can put up a seawall at San Francisco Airport and Oakland Airport to keep those and so forth and so on. Regrettably, or more interestingly, a paper uh, came out recently, which was picked up in the, in the media, in which the authors realized that the previous estimates for sea level change did not take into account the ice sheets in Greenland that are melting rapidly. This has been measured uh, and predicted, predicted and then measured. And so what do the new maps show? Let's just take a look at Mumbai for a minute in India. Here's where the old projection was for sea level rise. And here's the new projection for sea level rise. Entire portions of Mumbai are now underwater. How about Shanghai? Uh, and I, I marked the boon here. And for those of you that have traveled to Shanghai and hung out at that popular tourist destination. But in uh, 2050, in the new projections, the boon is underwater as as much of south of Shanghai. How about Alexandria in the Middle East? Uh, here's the previous projections, and here are the new projections. Alexandria is underwater. This is tens of millions of people displaced uh, in terms of uh, consequences of climate change. I remember uh, speaking with 
security agents in Israel as I was trying to pass through the airport at one time, and they were challenging me as to why Israel should care about climate change. If you've ever flown through the Middle East, you know if you stop in one country and then another, that tends to get people upset uh, because of the relations. And so I, I told the Israelis, well, I tell you what, when six million people from Egypt decide to move to Israel because their city is underwater, I think Israel might be concerned about climate change. And they ceded the argument and let me get on the plane. Uh, another more recent, uh, in this, I decided to include this example because, of course, the recent events in Libya, which break all of our hearts, right? Which is if you live downstream from a dam and you're poor, uh, the consequences are devastating. And recently, people have begun to look at a certain kind of dam. So here's a picture from Nepal. It shows a glacier and a glacial lake formed underneath that glacier. If you've been privileged enough to hike in the mountains, you've probably seen these. And the lakes are bounded by piles of rock called moraines, and they contain the lake. And uh, the authors of the paper recognize that when pieces of the glacier break off into the lake, they can overflow these uh, earthen dams. Not only that, uh, the rising lakes can uh, introduce stress on these earthen dams and break them anyway. Fun fact, since 1990, the volume, number, and size of glacial lakes has grown by 50%. So the authors of this paper decided to take a look at what happens or what is the uh, threat from these uh, glacial lakes uh, uh, bursting and flooding downstreams. And they looked around the planet and they formed a nice map here which tells you about the risk level. And the bigger the disk, the bigger the risk level and look at where the biggest risks are for glacial flooding, which they turn out to be in India, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, and China. And so you can compare that with a world population map and recognize that what you thought of previously as a trivial thing in the mountains, a glacial lake burst, now has direct consequences for millions of people who live downstream. I think this is the last example of consequences, just to make sure I've made my point clear to you today, which is that a recent paper from Chinese scholars looked at 600,000 deaths in this window of time between 2013 and 2019. And they asked, what is the relationship between those deaths and the temperature outside? Uh, studies like this have been done before many times. This is the first one that looked at data from mainland China. And the interesting thing is you can look at, here's the 600,000 total number, here's the temperature you can see in the bottom, and you recognize that, for example, assault injuries are highly correlated with increased temperatures. Fascinating is that poisoning is highly associated with lower temperatures. I'll let you ponder that for a while. So uh, with these data then, the authors were able to take mathematical models then, or economic models for future and ask, how many additional deaths do we expect by 2050 due to climate change, due to these factors? And uh, here on the right, you'll see this is the economic model which is not fully sustainable, not uh, oil at drill and burn, but somewhere in between. So medium, medium sort of. And you recognize that by the 2090s, many tens of thousands of people are, uh, are injured uh, owing to the effect of temperature. If you go to the higher emissions rate, that is the uh, dr uh, drill and burn, uh, you realize that uh, in 2090 and even in the 2060s, many, many tens of thousands of people uh, uh, die or are injured uh, because of the climate change in mainland China. So let's just summarize where we're at. I wanna make sure you all feel good. Atmosphere is changing. The change is due to combustion. Radiative forcing is this concept that connects CO2 in the atmosphere to the temperature of the planet. On geological time scales, the Earth has managed this quite fine, thank you. Economic models allow us to connect the atmosphere to our future. And there are many urgent consequences of which I'm naming a few. And I would just point out that the biological consequences would take a whole nother seminar in fact, go online and watch Dr. Holcomb's seminar, which he just gave an hour earlier, on some of the consequences, biological consequences, often not discussed about climate change. 
what keeps me up at night? If this isn't enough, there are two little things that I want to share with you that are, that are vexing. The first one is calculus. And I know how much you love mathematics. I can see it emanating from your brains. But it's a relatively straightforward thing. Let's imagine this is the planet's climate state as a function of time. And you can think of this, for example, as the fluctuations of CO2 in the atmosphere for a million years. It hums along, oscillates along, it's noisy, things are happening. But what happens if there's a noisy event? For example, two or three years or more of drought in the Amazon and suddenly the rainforest dies back. What happens then is that we are at some sort of stable place with our climate for a million years, and we've jumped to a new stable place where there's no Amazon. And the climate is different than it was before. This is called a tipping event. This kind of tipping event is disastrous for the local community. It has consequences for the bigger community. But it's very difficult to undo. It's very difficult to go back and replant the rainforest, certainly in our lifetimes. There's another kind of event we start off with a noisy world, but uh, it's called a bifurcation uh, tipping event, where, for example, uh, one of the ocean currents completely collapses that has been governing our planet's uh, thermal management for millions of years. Then we, we, we don't go from one minimum to another. The whole landscape changes, and we are in a whole new climate state. It's, called a, uh, it's another tipping point. Now, these are mathematical concepts, which you could enjoy if you were studying mathematics. But um, recently, some authors decided to use mathematical methods to analyze whether or not a 1.5 degree global warming would trigger these kind of events. And you'll notice at the bottom here, here's 2 degrees C threshold, sea ice, sea gyres, Greenland, boreal forest, or at the other extreme, 4 degrees C you know, which are things like uh, ocean currents and Arctic winters and so forth. And these authors argued that as of now, we may have and likely have reached tipping points with respect to some of these things. That keeps me up at night. So let's just take a look at the uh, Atlantic meridial ocean currents. And I'm sorry I'm using something from the New York Times, but their graphics are so pretty, right? But you can see... Here's uh, an ocean current emanating from Africa. It's warm. It warms the coast of Brazil. Uh, it moves up along past Cuba and uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, forms the Gulf Stream, which people on the East Coast love so much for their mild um, sea temperatures, and then moves up along and ultimately will end up in England and, uh, and Northwestern Europe. And what uh, scientists have noticed is that there's a cold spot right underneath Greenland that's emerging almost certainly due to Greenland ice melting and cold water appearing in there. And as the uh, New York Times authors point out, this could be very consequential uh, for particularly the climate in Europe. So here's a still picture showing this North Atlantic current, where it goes past uh, Europe, how it circulates around, and here's this Labrador basin. And the first warning sign was a paper in 2018 which caught my eye in which authors used a mathematical model for climate change, a two degree C model, and they predicted that cold water would start appearing here. And in that paper, they actually measured it with satellites and found that the cold water was appearing. This gave confidence to the mathematical models that were being used, but also was the first warning flag that something may be happening with this ocean current. And then two other papers, the last of which was just recently, uh, these graphs, the details are not important for you. They represent time going in this direction. And each one of these graphs is a proxy for something having to do with the flow of this current up past uh, England. And all the proxies are decreasing. And then just last year, a review article appeared in which all the data and mathematical models were put into one picture. And the models here, going back 100 years or so, maybe 200 years, and going forward, and here's the data. You draw your own conclusions. We are flirting with a tipping point in which ocean currents moving past uh, northwestern Europe are going to change forever. 
And then, of course, there's the issue of justice, which keeps me up at night. What does that mean? Well, that means that we dig up coal, we pump out oil, and we pull out natural gas. And what do we do with it? We burn it. We burn it to produce the power we want to have to make our lives easier. We burn it to give us the mobility we want. And we burn it to give us goods and services that make our lives feel good. Now, every person in this room has profited from that, either directly or indirectly. And there's a problem with that. The problem is that the profits from that process do, are not shared equally with those who've experienced the burdens. So you can ask the people in South America, you can ask the people in Africa, to what extent have your people flourished like Elon Musk has? To what extent have they flourished because of what's happening in the environment? And they will say they have not been flourished. They will say they have been exploited. And that is a problem in environmental justice. Now, what are the consequences of climate change? This, for example, is a map showing sea level change uh, in colors to remind you that sea level change is not uniform across the planet. Where the water is warmer, the seas are higher. So if you happen to live, for example, uh, in this portion of the southern Pacific, your sea level rise is much larger than it is through luffs in the Bay Area. So the consequences of sea level rise are not visited equally upon everybody. And we just saw, for example, how Norway and India, as examples, uh, <clears throat> benefit differently or not benefit as a result of climate change. So the consequences are not shared equally, and this is a problem of climate justice. And I want to return back and just mention to you this notion of if you read the Gospels, as I do, and you believe in Jesus Christ, as I do, and then you look at the powers and principalities that are delivering these justice problems, you have a disconnect. I have a disconnect. This can't work. So what are we going to do? So let's take a few minutes and just uh, talk about what to do. Uh, I was talking with someone, I think it was John earlier, about the one thing you can't do as a climate scientist is stand up in front of a community and advocate for a bigger government. That's a non-starter for much of the U.S. population. And I'm going to refer to the United Nations. And I know what you're going to say. No way are we going to be subject to that organization. I'm not asking you to be run by the United Nations. What I am saying to you is that as an organization, the United Nations is much more representative of all voices than, for example, the House of Representatives in the United States. And so if I want to look to a body that's representative about what to do about the future, I would look to the UN because they have voices that I wouldn't normally hear and voices that I need to hear. Voices that tell me, for example, that we need to ensure reliable, sustainable, uh, energy for all. Voices that tell us that we need to take urgent action with regard to climate change. And entities like the United Nations and the International Panel for Climate Change have very specific things that they analyze and predict, and the people responsible for those analyses and predictions are more representative than, for example, this guy is. So present-day technologies that give us hope. Let's take a look at the low-hanging fruit. So first of all, this is a bar chart, and uh, up at the top here, the size of the bar tells you how much you could mitigate current emissions, okay? And the blue, bar, the blue part of it means it's relatively low cost, and the darker the red, the more expensive. Look, friends, the low-hanging and obvious fruit is wind and solar energy. It's clearly the way to mitigate the most carbon emissions, and uh, it can be done relatively inexpensively. But as Dr. Holcomb reminded us earlier, caution, because wind energy has, is, and will kill birds. And we have to think about how to manage that. Solar energy relies on materials that are not made in the United States, and it takes up a lot of land. And so bulldozing 100 square miles of the California desert for our electrical power is also a non-starter. 
But there are opportunities, and wisely we can deploy those. And if you're a church or a congregant, what you're thinking of, the one thing I can do for climate change today is I can be an advocate for and use as best I can wind and solar energy. You can avoid demand for energy services as a congregant and as a, member, as a homeowner, if you should be that way. The appliances you buy are important. They make a difference. And so choose wisely those appliances uh, to uh, mitigate these costs. There are other things that are very powerful, as you can see on these bars. For example, uh, reduce conversion of forests and their ecosystems. So given that we are well off as a world in terms of production, why do we keep burning and tearing up forests to make more space for whatever it is you want? We should stop doing that you can advocate to stop doing that. We can talk about ecosystem restoration, afforestation and reforestation, wisely done, that has a potentially big impact. It gets expensive the more carbon. But if you look at these scales, which may not be so clear to you, these four or five bars constitute um, many uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions mitigated per year. Uh, there are other things, so for example, in transportation, uh, the conversion to uh, public transportation, the conversion to electric vehicles, particularly in uh, transport and so forth, are all low-hanging fruit. Fuel switching, although expensive. And when I talk to my friends who are capitalists who build things, they uh, make concrete or they make steel, uh, they're talking about converting these plants to burning hydrogen instead of using fossil fuels, and provided the hydrogen is sourced in a way uh, that doesn't involve also creating CO2, it makes a lot of sense. So there are present day technologies to mitigate emissions. There's good reason to hope, and there's action you and your congregations can do. Regrettably, if you look at the emissions as a function of these various economic scenarios, under no circumstances do we really get back to pre-industrial pre times. And that leaves us with another problem. Can we invoke negative emission technologies, as it were, to take carbon out of the atmosphere, out of the oceans, or out of the places that we've dumped it and sequester it or place it in some place where it is gone forever? And, uh, you know, I just came back from a conference, and I don't want to spend too much time in this today, but just to remind you that uh, this is a meeting of people who are particularly concerned with these negative emission technologies. So they meet for a morning to talk about how to get out of the lab and make things work in real life. They talk about converting CO2 into products. There was a company present at this that was taking CO2 from the air and using technology to convert it to the foam that's in the seat cushions you're sitting on. Uh, it's a very clever idea. Um, there are uh, economists, sociologists, and uh, uh, scholars of literature talking about societal impacts of our technologies. Innovations in CO2 capture, this is an area I personally work in at Berkeley. Um, systems challenge, where are we gonna get all the power and where are we gonna deliver it and how are we gonna do that? The few people who've tried it, and of course looking at ocean land and forests, how to store it. And then the capitalists had their last say at the end to talk about value chains and making money from CO2 capture and sequestration. So let me just say that after a conference like this, 120 people embedded together from breakfast until bedtime talking about these issues, very exciting, very, very exciting, lots of really great ideas happening. So I have a great deal of optimism and a great deal of hope for where we can go forward it starts with you in your home, it starts with your congregation, and it starts with your advocating for and being part of the kinds of things that can change our emissions, such as wind and solar energy. But I'd be remiss in this particular setting to not close with one final thought. When I was a child, I used to watch cartoons, and there was a cartoon in particular that I loved, and it was called Roadrunner cartoons. Maybe you're familiar with it. If you're not, you can look it up on YouTube and check it out. But the cartoons were very familiar. They had the same sort of setting. There was a coyote chasing a roadrunner, and the coyote envisioned all kinds of technological schemes to capture the roadrunner. And it, 
Inevitably, the schemes would fail because the technology was too complex or because the coyote didn't understand it. And there were these moments in the cartoons, they're called cartoon fiction, where, for example, the coyote realized the mistake and was suspended in midair, as you can see here, holding the rock, anticipating exactly what was coming next. And I think what I wanted to say to you is that in spite of being inspired by these people who I work with, people who are at these conferences, inspired by the opportunities, there is a sense amongst all of them, and maybe with you too, that we are untethered, if I can use that expression, untethered from what was previously our reality. And that's really upsetting. It's really disturbing. And as we move forward with the many changes that have to happen to deal with climate change, we're going to become further untethered from the things that we know have made our lives previously so productive. And there's really a very excellent place you can go for the untethered life. And it starts with your Christian faith and your expression in worship and service and study. And that's a place to get tethered to something that has meaning in the long run. Thanks. I have, uh, happy to answer any questions. I guess they could be here or they could be in the virtual world. So I'm happy to take a question, comment, anger, frustration, untethered. Good, follow that link. I agree. Yeah. Sure, you mentioned that you work on carbon storage. Carbon capture. Carbon capture. Uh -huh. Is that how you're really dealing with emerging communities where there's air quality capture? Is it mostly through nature-based solutions or other types of projects? Thanks for the question. Let me phrase the answer if I didn't say this already. So the people who want to conduct negative emission technologies, that is to say take things out of the air, have natural and unnatural technological solutions. I work on the technological solution side, which is I work and develop materials and machines that take CO2 out of the air and deliver it to X. I'll say more about X in a minute. There are other entities that manage soils, uh, for example, as another uh, excellent way to increase the carbon storage of the soils. And the amount of carbon that can be stored in soils is enormous, by the way. Um, so I work on the unnatural side, if I can use that, that phrase, uh, and uh, in particular I develop materials that can uh, sponge CO2 out of the air, even though the air is full of a lot of things that are very difficult to deal with, like oxygen and water. Um, so th that was one question, sorry. I, 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 uh... So are you talking about direct air capture? Yeah, direct air capture, right. So I do direct air capture, sorry. I guess you know more, than, sorry, excuse me. Yes, I do DAC. Um, now, what do you do with the CO2 when you've captured it, no matter uh, what kind of uh, direct air technology you use? And uh, this is a, a missing link. We understand the geology of putting CO2 underground is pretty well understood. Some locations for putting CO2 underground are very well characterized. And we have this awkward handshake with oil companies who know the most about what's going on underground and we need their expertise to do this, although they're not exactly the most favorable partner, if I can be so blunt. Uh, but uh, underground storage is certainly uh, good for maybe a third of the total carbon we can capture with these kind of technologies. Uh, there have been some recent advances, you may have heard about this in the media, in which rather than take CO2, compress it into a uh, supercritical fluid and pump it underground. You actually take CO2 and you make bubbly water and you put the bubbly water underground. 
and uh, a group of scientists in Iceland pioneered this and it's now being used many other places. So for certain kinds of basalt, the CO2 in the water becomes rock in a year or two. And that's a phenomenal storage mechanism. Uh, people are looking for basalt ridges and particularly basalt ridges that are in the oceans so that the uh, ship technology could have DAC on board, maybe nuclear powered ship, DAC on board, pump it underground and sequester it. But um, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna answer your question more broadly and say, none of these is sufficient. All of them have to be deployed. And one of the things that happens in the scientific community, maybe a lot like Christians, is that rather than get along, we sort of tear each other apart. Oh, that solution's not good enough because of this, and this solution is not, and that's regrettable. And I think the good news is that the scientific community is starting to realize all solutions are good solutions and we need to pursue them all with vigor. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, here's, a do, here's a doodad here. Uh, thank you, especially for the contextual and um, linking the climate change with uh, people, the figure of people that are really uh, affected. So the basin forest of Congo, uh, where I come from, uh, scientists and even the UN has testified that the basin forest of Congo has the capacity uh, to consume 20, nine billion tons of carbon dioxide that are not produced in Congo, but that comes from somewhere else, mostly uh, developed countries. Uh, so when it comes to environmental justice that we have just talked about, uh, what can be your take on that? That uh, a small um, forest, big forest, Congo Basin forest, is consuming more than what is being produced in Congo. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can take that. I, I think I understand your question, and I think I understand the answer, maybe, which is that if a country in Africa bears the responsibility for sequestering carbon, then the countries that emit carbon should be paying for that service and they should be paying for that service at a rate that is uh, consistent with what they would pay for the same services in their own country. And I, I suspect what you're gonna say to me is that the United States doesn't do anything of the kind. And I um, am ashamed that that's so. And it would be my personal effort and I hope the efforts of my congregation that we would seek to change that but that's it. What is it uh, Mary Poppins said? A pie crust promise, easily made, easily broken. Unfortunately, promises made by colonial countries in particular aren't always, aren't always upheld. That's a sin, in my opinion. Yes, sir. If you were a benevolent dictator of the world, how would you um, handle uh, stopping uh, the oil use in a way that would be uh, the least damaging to people and the most beneficial to people or the planet? Yeah. The, um that's a great question, and um, that's a, it's a difficult one to answer because part of me, a significant part of me, is the climate activist that wants to do this and just say, shut the damn power plants off. Um, excuse my language. But I, I also am enough of a scientist and engineer to know, for example, that if a community borrowed $18 billion to build a coal-fired power plant, that has a 30 year lifetime and I'm to shut it down after year four, who pays the bill? So I have to, I'm trying to mitigate my urges and think about um, strategies where, where we can partner 
uh, with government uh, so as to incentivize the right thing to do. The, the difficulty, of course, is urgency. These matters are urgent. And uh, that's so government incentivation to change an industry from position one to position two is, is not very popular and doesn't usually work urgently. But I would urgently, if I were in charge, urgently press for incentives to move uh, industries to sustainable ones first. And that would start with power. And uh, so I would, if I were the US government uh, in charge, I would say I'm willing to pay, the taxpayer is willing to pay to shut down that plant today and have no more loans against it. There's no, uh, and if, so that takes away this sort of angst over that power plant and now allows that community to say, well, hey, let's uh, rebuild it now as a name a renewable power source. That's one thing I think I could do or we could do. I was talking with John earlier about uh, electric vehicles. I, I understand completely uh, that the materials for an electric vehicle are sourced irresponsibly, uh, and I understand the consumer is really concerned about charge and um, and, and time on the, online, but those things are gonna get fixed pretty quickly. I mean, as someone in the scientific community, I can tell you sodium batteries are, gonna, are just around the corner. It's not that far away. And so uh, what I would say is, as we have done, I think, well, I don't wanna say a president's name, I think as the current US government has done, if we incentivize electric vehicles, the electric vehicles will evolve to be more sustainable rather than, um, so it's incentives, uh, which our government is do, and sorry to sound so waffling, but in 10 years, the Bay Area has gone for almost no electric vehicles. So almost every car you see is an electric vehicle. That's phenomenal uh, incentivization, okay? And all we have to do is move that needle. Uh, let me just say then one other thing and I'll shut up, which is it's, it's astounding to me that we would introduce the lithium ion battery vehicle without laws to recycle the battery. It's just completely nonsensical to me that that would happen. Because if that were developed alongside the lithium ion battery, then some, not all, but some of these issues would have been mitigated. The sourcing of the materials is problematic, but there are other battery chemistries coming along. There are even some commercially available that uh, don't use cobalt and manganese and, and other metals. So, um, so I've waffled too much. Incentiv incentivization from the government pushed by the community, pushed by the voters, is probably the best I can hope for in this country at the present time. And I think we can do that. And congregations can do that too. Yeah, right behind you is somebody you need to talk to. Right, Jerry? Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, you can, as a citizen, you can, if you, let's say you were involved, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you or know you, but let's say you were involved in, you know, a used car business or something like that. You could make an appointment with your state representative and you could go to their office and you could say, people are hungry for electric vehicles. Help me out, help me make money by incentivizing used electric vehicles in the marketplace. Uh, I don't know whether that representative would listen to you, but most of us don't realize we have that we have that authority we can go in and say something and if you get four or five people together from your community then they kind of have to see you and i've discovered that myself and i think sherry knows it even much better than i have we can make we can make changes I, friends i i just want to encourage you to use the mic when you oh. are speaking so ask for the mic first so that those who are joined with us on zoom uh can also uh hear you um and i want to just uh, lift up a, a big question from uh, from the Zoom chat um, that says, thank you, for, from Karen Bradley, thank you for your talk. What is your personal level of optimism about humanity's ability to turn the ship of Earth towards a sustainable future? Nine out of ten. Nine out of ten. We can do this. 
We can do this. Jeff, I'm gonna talk just for a second to give you a minute to think about this. What I'd like to know is, do you have recommendations for books or movies that are available to further our engagement in our journey in both personally and as a congregation? And if you don't, it's okay because there's the wine reception and that but might, you know, jog some loose. Well, I've, I, I have a, a confession and a recommendation. So um, since I was a child, I'm a huge science fiction fan. So um, most, most of the nonfiction that I read is science fiction. But it turns out science fiction has been a great venue uh, to inform us about climate change. And um, Tim Stanley Robinson is an author who lives in Davis. Uh, Quirky man, popular author. He wrote a, a book called Ministry of the Future. It was published a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a tough read, uh, but anyone who is interested in climate change and policy and what can happen going forward, I would recommend that book because uh, the premise of the book is that uh, the UN decides to spawn a new agency, which is to protect the rights of children in the future. And it uh, seems like a great idea, and then they stumble into what really has to happen to protect the children's right in the future. And then the book sort of evolves over 30 or 40 years of what's happening. It's really a powerful book, and I would recommend that. That's what I'll say right now. Anything else? Oh, yeah. I'm guessing it's tough emotionally for all of us because this is a hugely daunting problem. It's the worst problem we've faced. Um, the current strategy, I think, is based upon the 2015 uh, UN agreement, um, which was a voluntary agreement. All nations came to the table and said, this is e what each one of us will do. Earlier this week, the Secretary General stated that that strategy is not working. We are way behind. So it seems like we're without an effective strategy right now. I mean, we have, the, we have the technology, we have a lot of the means, but we need an overall strategy. Uh, Al Gore mentioned within the last week, right, he s said it more than once, that he was convinced, I think as you are, that we'll solve this problem. The question, will we solve it in time? So it's, we're in a race against time, and I guess what I'm wondering is, what is your suggestion uh, for an alternative strategy? Well, uh, the forces of capitalism haven't always served everybody equally but the forces of capitalism have produced change much more quickly than governments have. And um, so one other way to sort of look at this problem is how would, you, how would you create industries or incentivize industries to move quickly on this so that large amounts of wealth could be created quickly? Uh, you know, even as I say that, I'm like, my heart is like, oh, don't say that. Okay, but let me just, that's one, one, one strategy is to let the capitalists loose and try to get them on this problem. And if they were benchmarked and, you know, and corralled uh, with appropriate government oversight, that might work. That's not my first choice. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure many of my fellow congregants would not choose that either, but you asked for an alternative. And so one alternative, I think, is, is to do that because the way I read our current country's climate, we'll get to you in just a second, okay? The one reason we get to our current country's climate is because so many people are absolutely compelled about the role of the individual and the absence of government authority in their lives. And so they're not gonna move the needle if I make government influence bigger. So, you know, Elon Musk is an interesting character because if you look what has happened with SpaceX, um, 
and how that's affecting the environment and so forth. And then you look at what has happened with Tesla. I mean, I don't think anybody thought electric vehicles were possible in the way in which Tesla made it possible. Now, you know, there are caveats to that, and I'm not a big fan of Elon Musk, but you see what I mean? There's, there, there could be windows of opportunity here, but they're not the ones I would choose. And I'm hoping your voice comes up now so that we can hear an alternative. Well, I, I, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, I feel like the capitalist system is what got us into this mess. It did. And to count on them just seems like suicide to me that we have to insist on finding a way <laughs> to change the entire system that is not based on pure profit. If we have to profit on everything we do, we're, it's not sustainable. I, you know, yeah, anyway, I, and I, capitalism I, I, requires profit, so I just don't see that. I mean, I value and understand that opinion. I, what I will say is there are models for example, in, in Northwestern Europe, places like Norway in particular, where, where government action is producing a lot of change quickly uh, and companies are also benefiting from it, but it's, it's because they're corralled and bounded by the rules of the government. So I'll give you an example. Rotterdam uh, is a city in which there's a huge amount of chemical industry and their carbon emissions from that industry are enormous. And um, you know, they are basically now required to convert those industries to a green hydrogen. And so they're gonna learn and they're gonna do it and they're gonna make it happen uh, with green hydrogen and they will be the role model for the rest of the world on how to get these things done. And I can only hope that, it, so Pittsburgh isn't maybe the city that demonstrates it does, but maybe if Rotterdam does, then maybe we'll have to follow Rotterdam. Um, and not be so U.S. centric. I value your, your thoughts and opinions. I share many of them. I was asked for an alternative. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. Hi, thanks. I want to go back to direct air capture since that's your area of expertise. Um, and I have followed it over the last 20 years and it is really very exciting, especially some of the options that you just described. You, I'm sure, know there's concern among the environmental community that uh, the oil companies are very excited about direct air capture because they see it as potentially a way that they can just keep on doing what they've been doing and keep making record profits and their emissions will just get put underground. So it seems like it is an important technology, um, but then the question is how do we not let it turn into a get out of jail free card for the fossil industries? And I'm curious, what, so it's really a policy question is how do you make sure that the work that you're doing doesn't turn into um, having unintended consequences for the goals that we're all trying to reach? Yeah, I, I remember giving a, a talk at a California university in which there are protesters in the back about how I was enabling big oil. And um, it was very upsetting. Um, <clears throat> I can't, I, um, I can't guarantee much about what happens outside of my lab in terms of its use. I can advocate for it. What I can say is I don't take any money from oil companies. I don't participate or collaborate with them, and many of my colleagues in the DAC community do because they have a lot of money and they, they give money for research and you, know, you could call it greenwashing or whatever. And I would like some of that money. There are times when I wish I had some of that money. Uh, so, so that's one thing I can do, and I can make that clear to my students who are working with me. We're not, we're not going to, we're not going to the Exxon dinner suite, you know, tonight for that sort of thing. Um, it, it, the, the problem I think that you're really referring to is the fact that, that certain industries, and oil in particular, have an outsized influence on our policy and government, way outsized influenced, and um, it's really hard to imagine how to do that. One thing that the Biden administration could do is declare a climate emergency and prohibit the drilling of any new uh, oil and natural gas uh, within the sphere of influence of the United States. 
I would like to see that happen. Do I think that's going to happen? You tell me whether you think that's likely. Not if he wants to be reelected. Um, but maybe after Biden is reelected, he would do that, right? Knowing that there wouldn't be. A, but that's the kind of action that would have to happen from the government sector to sort of corral that industry. And, and by the way, uh, as many have pointed out, while even if we could do that in the United States, uh, much of the oil, world's oil is produced outside of the United States, and we don't have any control about that. Uh, that. So it's a, it's a vexing conundrum. I don't have an answer for you. I live on a knife edge, right? And um, it's a little frustrating sometimes, but I live on a knife edge. That's right. Very wise to point that out. Drew, you got something else online or? Um, yeah, I'll, tr I'll try this one um, from Richard Randolph. Uh, how much does economic prosperity affect GHG production? In other words, would an economic downturn act as a wedge strategy for bridging to a lower carbon world? Well, we know the answer to that. Uh, sorry, whoever it was, oh, online. We know the answer to that, and that was COVID. And uh, during the COVID, uh, the, the most serious COVID times, carbon emissions went way down. And so, so yes, we, we've done that experiment and we know that experiment works. I'm not sure uh, advocacy for downsizing of, of industrial processes and work uh, would be effective political policy. You please. No, I'm just. But would it be um, a strategy, not a suggestion for a long-term way of life, but you know, like like a like a an action, <laughs> like if if we mobilized an effort and shut everything down for a designated period of time to to make the point to say, we demand that change happen, and it can happen if government acts and government intervenes, and, and, and we do it once a month, maybe. <laughs> How do you think, what do you think about of this as uh, activism? In the end, activism may be the only thing that works, to be honest. I'm, I'm just remembering time for my youth, Vietnam War, protest blocking a freeway, and you know, the LAPD beat the crap out of me while I was, you know, while I was protesting. That wasn't really a lot of fun. Uh, so there's some real risk associated with that. And if we're willing to do that, Am I willing to do that again? It's getting close. It's getting close. I, I see. I see people going. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that. <laughs> but we do have an opportunity to chit chat outside, right? If we uh, want to continue. Absolutely. Something. Right. Yes. So I think with that, let us thank Dr. Jeffrey Reimer one more thank time. We hope so much that you'll uh, join us for a reception uh, back the back the way you came up here. <laughs> Thank you all.